I'm going to take us back to the book here. An Amtrak, a lightly armored amphibious vehicle, first platoon, 325, struck a landmine only a few hundred meters from our position. So this is another operation that you're out on. And this is where we started this uh, day off. We heard the explosion, saw the smoke and flames rising behind us, and then heard the cries for help over the radio. We couldn't go to their aid. The bridge had not yet been cleared, and we were almost certain it had been mined by the enemy. Besides, we couldn't leave our blocking position without exposing the left flank. The track burned as 325's fellow Marines and my friend and mentor, Lieutenant Diana, from our weapons company, frantically tried to free the men trapped inside. Inside Alpha 3, I could see this color drained from my men's faces. They looked absolutely stricken. Then the track's ready ammunition began cooking off. With each detonation, I could see my men flinch. I ordered everyone to face south. I didn't want my men to see what was unfolding. Hearing it over the radio was bad enough. Five Marines died inside the track. Everyone else inside suffered wounds of varying degrees. The driver was pulled from the wreckage, his face bloody and missing teeth. The explosion had slammed his head against the vehicle's front console. Another Marine emerged with his uniform on fire. Quick-thinking men nearby got him on the ground and put the flames out with a fire extinguisher. Of all my experiences in combat, this is the one that haunts me the most. The feeling of complete impotence in the face of such a profound tragedy scarred us all that day. Gabe Diana had actually served in Lima 325. It's a reserve unit out of Columbus, Ohio. Before he became active duty and then became an officer, he was an enlisted with 325. And I remember when, when we were starting this operation and 325 came to our base, him bringing some of these these guys. Hey, man, I man, he grew up with them. I mean, these were his brothers. And now they were firefighters. They were police officers all brought together for this mission. Man, it was brutal. Absolutely brutal. And I, 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 I remember hearing a story about this woman from Columbus who they had lost, I think it was over 20, I think it was around 22 Marines from Lima 325 during that deployment. And she decided to paint these beautiful murals, murals of each one. And they were so nice that the Marine Corps Museum for a while put them right in their foyer. Right As soon as you walk into the museum, there they were. And they were big. And I, I, I remember hearing the story. And then I was doing a shoot with the UFC and the Marine Corps when the Marine Corps was advertising with the UFC. And, and part of the shoot was going to be us as fighters and then with the Marines going to the Marine Corps Museum. And I was kind of, you know, both sides of the fence on that. And we walked in, and they were there. And I didn't know. I didn't expect it. And it was really tough because here I am. You know, I'm, I'm around these Marines, and I'm around you know some of my buddies. And Rashad Evans, Forrest Griffin were there. And I mean, as soon as I walked in, man, my eyes filled up with tears. Yeah. You know, being getting the opportunity to to meet some of these men very briefly. Then we set off and go. And because of my relationship with Gabe Diana, who was my mentor at the time, and knowing what he went through that day childhood brothers of his and 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 him also being helpless uh and nothing's fair in combat sure. we know that nothing's fair and and you don't have the choice again you don't have the choice that gets cleared on that force continues to push west so that we could finish the mission of this operation we got to continue providing our blocking position and that's it if you lose focus more of that's going to happen it's 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 a difficult thing to deal with but that's what we signed up to do that that's why we have an all volunteer force, and it's the greatest military force this world has ever seen. And it's unfortunate, but part of it is dying. We die in battle, so that the innocent people here that live in America don't. And it sucks, and it's painful. But at the end of the day, we all we know when we sign up, we know that that is a possibility. It is indeed. Now, you had. Nine guys wounded from your platoon. Is that right? From that from that whole deployment. It's from from that couple days. Okay. Yes. Yeah, here we go. Yes. Nine men in a week. Yeah. Here, I'll go to the book. But some of them were the reservist tankers that weren't technically mine. But yes. Got it. 
The loss of so many Marines under my command had eaten away at me, almost to the point where I suffered a crisis in confidence. Nine men in a week of combat. What had I done wrong? What had I done wrong? What lessons could I learn? My mind obsessed over those questions. Inside the COC, I braced for the shitstorm. Captain Ford Phillips, my company commander, spotted me as I came through the door. He swiftly took me aside. Here it comes, I thought. Brian, excellent job. You did everything right out there. Thank you. My jaw almost fell open. Those were the last words I had expected to hear. I greatly admired Captain Phillips and had long since learned he always meant what he said. His words were never designed to make someone feel better. They were always designed to make a man a better officer and a better Marine. Always. His words eased the pain of the last seven days but did not erase the guilt that I felt. To this day, I question the decisions I made that night. That is the onus of command. You always bear the responsibility for those under you. When they suffer wounds or are killed by the enemy, it is impossible for an officer not to second-guess himself and own part of their suffering or deaths. As leaders, we understand control. That is where we operate. Having it is comfort. But combat and the enemy strips that away at times. Once the bullets fly and the violent chaos of a firefight reigns, control becomes an illusion. A platoon commander cannot determine which enemy bullets will strike what vehicles. He cannot select the moment when an insurgent triggers an IED. He cannot dictate who survives and who doesn't. All he can do is try and fight back to try and demolish the chaos with enough firepower that the enemy dies or runs away. Almost everything else is beyond the leader's control. Those limits of leadership were never drilled into us at the academy. When I experienced it for the first time during Operation Matador, I came gradually to understand on an intellectual level. But in my heart, I still wonder if I could have done something else that might have saved my Marines from harm. I still spend sleepless nights replaying every moment in my head, hoping men like Robert Gass and Jonathan Lowe can forgive me. All part of it, man. And I, it's, it's funny you read that passage. I was up last night, same thing, 2.45 in the morning and, and, and replaying it. And it, it's not something I would say there's a negative aspect. People will hear me say that and be like, oh, man, that's bad, you know, post-traumatic stress or something. No. It's, it's me being a human being who cares and wonders. And it's hard. That's never going to go away. And I'll always wonder that. You know, would it have been a better decision to take a left turn and, and abort the mission at that point? Should I have tried to get back to the bridge? Or if I'd have gone three blocks up, maybe there would have been a path we could have found and put our headlights on. There are so many what ifs, so many what ifs that, that you go through. As leaders, and if if you try to ignore those times where you spend those sleepless nights and not think through it, I think it makes it worse. I think the fact that I'll go through the drill like last night, which is the first time in a long time that I did, um, I think part of it because I knew we, we'd probably be talking about it. I, I think it's healthy to do that. For me, at least, it has been. You know, it's healthy for me to replay that and to understand. And and you know, you you talked about that moment with my company commander Ford Phillips. I remember that conversation and I remember kind of going back at him a little bit and saying, you know, I just, I think if I would have done this or done that and he stopped me, Brian, listen, you did everything right. You did everything that you could do out there. And and it was, you know, it was definitely what I needed to hear because we still had a long way to go in that deployment and I still had to go do another one. It was, it was great leadership on his part because it, it gave me, there was no more second guessing at that point. You know, because I, it, that was not the time to sit there and start to question my decision and my instincts in battle that had served me well up until that point. I had a, uh, a similar conversation, as a matter of fact, with Leif. So, you know, when, when Mark Lee got killed, it was uh, Ryan Job who ended up dying as well, but he had been severely wounded. And Leif was down at a combat outpost with his platoon and we got 
Ryan Job had been Kazavaked out, and now the guys are down at this combat outpost. And the army, who the 137 um, Bulldogs, Bravo Company, who we had an amazing relationship with, Captain Mike Bahama, main gun Mike, they they were out trying to trying to get after it, and they got to a point where they said, "Hey, we think we know where these guys are that shot Ryan." Do you, can you guys help us? I mean, it was like the worst day of fighting. And Leif called me up on the on the radio and says, hey, w- w- I want to go back out. They think they know where these guys are. I want to go back out. And I was like, go, go get some. And he went out and, you know, they were under heavy fire. And, and that's when Mark got killed. And, you know, Leif was, you know, he, he was... You know the mission gets done and all that but next day Leif comes to me and he says um you know hey hey Jocko I'm you know he was tore up you know he was tore up his 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 friend his brother was was dead his other friend was severely wounded but what really got to him was Mark because you know he'd made this decision to go back out and he said to me you know I, I just don't know if I you know I don't know if I made the right decision and I said to I said to him Leif there was no decision to make. There was Americans out there fighting in the streets trying to get after these guys that had wounded one of your guys, one of our guys. And they thought they knew where he was and they thought you could go and get them. There's no decision to make. You don't even have a choice in that situation. You do what you do as an American, as a SEAL, as a frogman. There was no decision. You did what we do. And I think that's something that any leader, when you get your young leaders out there, you know, obviously, if they screw something up, obviously, that's a different story. But, you know, you don't have the luxury of knowing what's going to happen in a combat situation. There's no crystal ball. There's no, you don't know. Like what you just said, guys would say that stuff to me sometimes. Like, you could have gone left or right. Oh, really? Because if you could have gone left like you just talked about and hit a giant ID and now yep. everyone's dead. You could have gone straight and you could have gotten clear. You don't know. Mm-mm. You don't have that luxury in combat. You're making decisions based on the information that you have at that time. You don't know all this other shit yet. Mm-mm. If you knew it, obviously looking back, hindsight's twenty twenty. We wouldn't have even gone there in the first place. But we don't know that. The only way to avoid any risk is not to go, is not to do your job, is to just go ahead and stand up, raise your hand, and say, I'm a coward. That's how you can avoid these situations. But guys in the Marine Corps, guys in the SEAL teams, they don't raise their hand and say that. They raise their hand and say, where's the bad guys? We're going to get them. And one of the mistakes you can make too is sometimes you want to stop and you want to think about it. Sometimes there is no right answer, right? There, there's a bunch of things you can do. There's a bunch of options right. and whatever one you take and maintain tempo and achieve tempo and stay a step ahead of the enemy is the right one. It's yeah. how you execute it. Yeah. Either way, you could be going into into a bad day, but you better do it your way and on your terms. Yeah, one thing that's guaranteed to turn into a bad day is sitting there and not doing nothing. Absolutely. Because I'll tell you what, if you're not maneuvering, the enemy is maneuvering. They are. If you're not maneuvering, the enemy is absolutely maneuvering. They're getting, they're flanking you, they're getting a high ground, they're doing something. So you better just be in action, taking action, make a decision and go. Especially on their turf. Their yeah. turf, oh, yeah. their cities, their neighborhoods, they know every corner. We're guessing. 